Today is November the 12th, and it is 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the interviewers today are Kate McNulty and Mike Wilson, and we are interviewing Mr. Edwin Olmstead. Mr. Olmstead, do we have your permission to take this conversation? Sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Olmstead, where exactly were you born and in what year? Mount Morris, New York, in Livingston County, in 1914. And you lived there for how long? Oh, uh, I'm a little foggy on our dates. I was born in the Methodist Parsonage, and it was the custom to move more often than they do now. Uh, tracing it, I remember some of the dates. I moved from Rochester to Batavia, 1921. So I must have been in Rochester for uh, maybe 1917 or 18 to 1921. I lost. I moved from uh, Mount Morris to Brockport to Rochester to Batavia. And I've, I, the, those don't quite fit in with four-year terms, but I left Batavia in 1925. That, yeah. uh, and so, what was your your earliest memory of your childhood? I'm not certain offhand. I. We, in Brockport, I remember we lived on a corner with a big lot on the corner and a uh, World War aviator in a Model T coupe turned too soon on the corner and rolled his car over in our front lawn one time. And I was a little more familiar with flying than he was driving just then. Okay. And was there any particular reason why your family moved you're around? You're going to so have much? to speak up. What? Was there any particular reason why your family moved around so much? Yes, yes. The Methodists were on a, a schedule. This is Methodist Episcopal. There are lots of kinds of Methodists you may discover sometime. And it was just basically the intent was for about a four year term. Uh, sometimes, if there was an emergency or something or other, why a con congregation or a pastor would be either moved out or moved in. Uh, what was your What did your parents do? He was a clergyman. Mother was a housewife. Did you come from a large family? No, just three of us. Two older sisters. And are they still living today? Yes. Uh, where about? Uh, one is 93 and living in, uh, she now has Alzheimer's, living in Hackettstown, New Jersey, or just outside Hackettstown. And the other one is a couple of years younger, and she has just moved from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to... Um, um, just north of Washington, Gaithersburg, I think it is. Okay. I haven't been down to see her yet. I've only had one or two letters with her so far. Okay. So, are you close with your sisters then? Yes, very. And you exchange information, like in the form of letters? Yes, yes. The older one now is, is uh, out of touch, but Really, she, uh, my mother was quite glad to turn over uh, assignments for bringing up a small boy to her as much as she could, and my older sister and I are very close. In fact, it's sort of hard to take her Alzheimer's. I can imagine. So your older sister had uh, a very important role in raising you when you were younger? Yes. And why was that? Because my mother wanted it that way. 
Mother had other interests. Such as? Very, very, this could be a long list. She, she was quite inclined to adopt an assortment of hobbies. Part of the time it was um, basket making, part of the time it was wax beads, great deal of quilting, all sorts of activities of that kind, as well as the duties she really kind of had uh, per force as a result of being a pastor's wife. So she was more of a, of a craftswoman. Yes, very much so. So how was your how was your father uh, as as a clergyman and a father? How was that relationship in in uh, your family? Well, we were always very close, and his interest became my interest. He was uh, uh, very much interested in hunting. And uh, partly because of his hunting, and partly because I have, I've always been crazy about machinery, and I've always, uh, far back as I can remember, been fascinated by both firearms and uh, cameras. Combination I think you'll find is rather rather frequent. So your your parents, especially your father, was very much an influence. Yes. Now, what about your sisters in terms of, it sounds like you have a, a very good relationship with your with your father, but your sisters, did they follow in your mother's example? Uh, no, I hate to call it that. It's just, uh, well, I don't know quite how to say this, but we were all quite close. A very tight-knit family. Mm-hmm, I think so. How about uh, your education? Was it difficult to move from one town to another, from one school to another? Uh, relatively, yes. My education, I do not look backward on the the primary area of it. Uh, Basically, I didn't even know the word boredom at the time, but basically the grades were an exercise in boredom. Uh, by the time the teacher coached the slowest person in the class, the 10th or 15th time on the thing, the same thing, I was bored. And I didn't even know the word, and they didn't recognize it. And it was just... Uh, Basically, school was a breeze, but... Uh, Did it make it harder for you in a way because it was so boring? You're a little louder, please. Did it, did it make it harder for you because it was boring? Or was it just something you didn't have to worry about? Well, I always found things to get myself into, and uh, frequently it was not what the teachers wanted. And uh, I just... Just sitting through the class and this, I hadn't even hadn't yet learned to say to myself, "This too will pass." It was just just abysmal. There were some specific examples that stand out in Corning and junior high school. We had an English teacher who had us read aloud. The Tale of Two Cities, which I had read before. And, of course, she was trying to coach the slowest person who stumbled through the words, if she could read them at all, syllable by syllable, and it was simply terrible. And I used to, well, I was interested in mathematical exercises and stuff. I tried to keep my finger in the place where, where they were reading, she knew within a microsecond when I'd lost my place and called on me, and of course I wasn't ready. And, uh, she taught me, but she didn't teach me what she was trying to teach me. You seem to be interested in other things during class. 
I'm interested in the classwork. While it's new and challenging and I'm learning something, I'm not interested in hearing it repeated when I learned it a week ago. So you were more of an individual rather than one that would... I think you could say that. So what kind of things did you get yourself into? Well, I like to read a lot. I received a camera, I think, on my 10th birthday. I was interested in photography. Uh, I always had a crush on firearms. Uh, I had a... Uh, the nicest toy I ever had was a Meccano set. Not the largest kind, but I made what I wanted with it. A considerable construction. I practically always had something or other I would entertain myself with. Uh, I think that's about all the immediate list I can... Maybe when I review this, I'll think of some more. So did you accompany your father on hunting? Expedition? Uh, yes. Mostly hunted woodchucks in the summertime. And I walked with him long before I could, maybe four years, five years before I was big enough to carry a gun of my own. Right. So you seem to be one that is interested in, in the outdoors, say, for instance, the hunting. How did you get to be interested in, in photography? That's a little bit of a misconception there. I am much more interested in machinery than in the outdoors. I've always been fascinated by machinery, too. I didn't mention that. But Dad was one of the relatively few people that I've laid in his cellar, and as soon as I was big enough to stand up to it, I started making things on it. Mm. So your dad was also a craftsman? Yes. What type of things did he, uh, did he build? Well, he, uh, I have a 16 drawer cabinet back here that he built and there are always things around he uh, I didn't keep much of the furniture he had but uh, he spent his Saturdays on his hobby relaxing clearing his mind for Sunday there were frequent things in our he bought a uh, we camped on one of the small lakes in the Finger Lake, well, rented cottages for a year or so, and then he bought a cottage and then built one next door to it and then tore down the first one and rebuilt it. And we had a uh, boat with an outboard motor that uh, sort of was mine to operate after the first couple of weeks. Uh, had a machine shop. We moved to barn one summer and made it into a machine shop there. So we had a shop at at home and the shop down at, at the lake. A uh, little hard to give an express list of things, but there was always something to do. So you had a summer home. Yes. And that was where again? The uh, place is Canadice Lake. It's one of the very smallest of the Finger Lakes. It's about 35 miles due south of Rochester, about, um, oh, maybe 50 miles from Buffalo. And how old were you when your father... I think I was eight the first sum summer we went there.
So how were the 1920s? Because if you were eight, again, it was you were born in 1914. So 21 or 22 is when we started at Canada. Yes. So how was that time coming out of World War One? How was that time for your family? I can't remember much about my only connection was strange connection with World War One. When we lived in Rochester, I when I was out in the yard, I we saw an occasional airplane, and uh, I knew about bombs, but I didn't know anything much about them. I just wondered if this was a bombing plane and that sort of thing. The one that seems rather strange to me in retrospect is that I, at that age, had germs and Germans mixed up. And I associated one with the other. I thought there was some relationship. So there wasn't really a good feeling about the Germans. Oh, no, no. Feelings were very strong then. Um, there were all sorts of... Uh, I felt feeling was much stronger then than it was for the Second War. For a deviation, I don't know whether you'll know, but there's a town in... Oh, um, New Hampshire, B-E-R-L-I-N, and feelings were so strong there, if you haven't heard about it, that they had a town meeting and decided what they were going to do about it, and like a town meeting, it came up with surprising results. They really didn't see their way clear to change the name radically, so they changed the pronunciation. And of all the Berlins, this one is pronounced Berlin rather than Berlin. And still to this day it's that way. Uh, in Corning, our church organist was a, by a fellow by the name of Gee, I thought I had it, but I don't. Anyhow, he had been virtually run out of employment during World War I. So there was some mixed emotions about Very it. Very well. I, I don't know how mixed. I, I uh, had the understanding that the feelings were very strong in many regards. Uh, I can't name any out right immediately, but I know of a number, heard of a number, of, vaguely recall a number of street names that were changed. And uh, like Berlin, some places changed their town names, but not in New Hampshire. How did your family react World War I? I don't think I can answer that question fairly. Were they well informed about world events at that time? I think so. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I you sort of think it's part of Dad's business to be well informed. Did he preach about the war at all? Some of the lessons? I couldn't remember. I was only war when the war ended. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you continue your education after high school? Oh, yes. So you attended the university? Yes. I uh, went to Allegheny, graduated in 
graduate in the class of 1935, you know, the degree bachelor's in physics. I'd always intended to go to MIT. I was fascinated by things. But uh, Allegheny, uh, I was planning to go to Allegheny just two years. But um, there was an opening as a student assistant in the physics department for two years. So I did that my last two years there and wound up with a degree. And then I went to MIT for two years more when had a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and then had a scholarship for tuition to stay there another year for a master's. And uh, actually 38 was a better time to get out of school than 37 was. Why do you say that? Employment. I don't know how many jobs were offered, but uh, there were plenty of people looking for us in 1938. There weren't so many, I can't give you the numbers, but. Okay. Well, MIT was very, very much industry related and had an assortment of people coming in for interviews. Uh, in 37, I, well, I think I had three or four. In 38, I recall there was like 15 or so. And what kind of businesses were, were looking for MIT graduates then? Well, they went by the departments we were in. Uh, my training was mechanical engineering, and uh, uh, gee, I don't remember, but well, I, General Electric, of course, was a standard. In fact, they they were very close to MIT. They had two cooperative courses: one in mechanical, one in electrical engineering, where a person went five years, alternated terms in school and at the plant and uh, round the clock, around the year, and had a five-year course and wound up in a little master's degree. Cooperative course, so-called. So there was rel relative stability at that time for employment and the economy. As far as I knew, actually, I never had any trouble. I worked, had gainful employment every summer. I didn't have any problem. Partly it was Dad's parishioner sometimes, or by the time 1937, uh, Lackawanna Steel had built a new strip mill, and I worked there until it, for a few weeks, and then got back to tech for a second term in a uh, uh, materials course, summer school. Okay. So then, what would be your opinion about the starting of, of World War II, the rise of the Germans in 1939. I didn't see it coming as clearly as some professed to. I uh, I recognized, uh, actually, the only language I ever enjoyed much was German. I had 
two and a half years of it at Allegheny, and uh, we we knew of Hitler, but we didn't recognize his absolute hold or any of the things that have come out since. I didn't pay enough attention to the world news. So, no, we. I think the whole story of the um, labor camps and come on, big boy, <sighs> and the uh, massacre all has developed post-war. I don't. I don't think we had any inclination, inclination of that. But as a side, you may not bring this up another time, a uh, good friend I knew here, uh, who died a few years ago, was in the first troops to enter one of the extermination camps. And I don't know how widely broadcast it is, but the uh, Aroma was simply overpowering and for miles around. And when any German living in a nearby town makes a claim that he was not aware of it, he cannot be right. It's just, just all pervasive. And... Did you have many friends in the military? Not close friends. I've accumulated far more acquaintances in the military since than I knew at the time. So you weren't, you didn't get any personal stories from many people that you knew? No. So you, it seems to me that world events weren't really popularized for you, but do you think that the rest of the United States was well informed? Information was available. I don't think that's a fair question. I, uh, I was an early subscriber to Time magazine. I read it rather faithfully, essentially cover to cover, and, uh, I think it was, as, I felt it gave us as good information as we could hope to get through whatever the restrictions were, whatever censorship, as far as people knew. There are many of these things we just didn't seem to know. We, If, if we knew them, they were maintained a secret. Well, so there was a certain degree of secrecy during the war. Oh, intense secre secrecy. I've always been sort of amused when we're getting ahead of the story, but when I uh, started Jack and Heinz and, and D-Day, they had just brought over the wreckage of six V-2 buzz, V-1 buzz bombs from England. And uh, the Wright Field invited three contractors to come and commit themselves to trying to prepare essentially Japanese copies of them in six weeks to start testing at Eglin Field in Florida. Uh, it wound up Ford Motor took the power plant, Republic took the airframe, and Jack and Heinz took the automatic controls. And that was so secret that we weren't allowed to speak of it or tell people what it was. The letter of intent was identified as MX-544, and so that was the only thing we could identify, the project MX-544. I've asked a great many people just from whom was that a secret? The Germans? The Japs? Or the American public that shouldn't have been allowed to know 
that we would have a deficiency of such a tremendous war machine. So these were bombers from England? These are buzz bombs. The uh, Actually, it had a pulse jet engine and uh, about a ton of explosive and a very interesting automatic control system in it, flight control. They would set them on a compass course and uh, set them for a time and they would, uh, if all went well, they'd burst at the proper moment or crash or run out of fuel and then crash and do considerable damage wherever they were. Almost like remote control. But they weren't, uh, no, no, they were autopilot. Mm -hmm. okay. They had an interesting autopilot, a something we never paid attention to it. On our own autopilots, we did the job with three gyroscopes, one for each of the three axes. Uh, they did it with one gyroscope and the compass. They inclined the gyroscope instead of having it along a particular axis, so it really detected all three axes and uh, gave them the uh, stability. They flew the thing. And the compass gave them the course. Okay. Could you describe the this process of with gyroscopes and, and uh, axes? I'm not familiar with that. Oh dear! I don't know as I could, and if I did, it would take all afternoon. Okay. This is a the. Sperry was the prime developer. Mr. Elmer Sperry himself was an expert in this thing. He'd been in gyroscopic control for a long time. They had big gyroscopes to keep ships on course and small ones for airplanes. On a ship, I think one gyroscope does the job because all you want to do is do a course. You can't change elevation or anything, but on an airplane, it controlled all three flight attitudes. And uh, you set the gyroscope on a course, uh, and, uh, and so long as the gyroscope performs properly, it maintains that course. <coughs> the uh, a little more on the use, the the automatic control is essentially a control box and some other equipment that. Uh, was very much used in long-distance flying. In fact, the people running, um, transporting military planes across the ocean used to joke about how they'd uh, set the gyro and sit there and cross their arm and go to sleep or whatever. One of my acquaintances in the industry later on was making a return trip one time when Lindbergh was in Europe, and Lindbergh asked aboard, and of course it's customary to give the visiting person, particularly of Lindbergh's stature, the pilot seat. <coughs> and after they got going, he reported that Lindbergh said, Do you mind if I turn off the Isle Pilot? No, go ahead. May I fly this? Sure. So Lindbergh insisted on fighting that thing, all all the winds and whatnot he had all the way across the Atlantic, instead of letting the autogyro do the job for him. I mean, I mean the, the gyroscope do the job for him. Which uh, was an interesting reflection on a man that's really dedicated to profession. I read two biographies of Lindbergh, and neither one of them mentioned this. So how was your, how were you involved with, with the World War II era? Well, um, my first job out of college was the Wright Aeronautical on engines, and I was in engine test. My master's thesis had been on valve gears of radial engines and 
When I went to write, I spent my first couple of months essentially repeating the work on Wright Cyclone that I had done in college on a Pratt & Whitney Wasp. And then uh, I was assigned to the carburation test stand and operated that thing for one shift for, oh, ten months or so. Then the, uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, my father was in the alternate delegate to the Uniting Conference. There were three different Methodist groups, Methodist Episcopal, Methodist South, and Methodist Protestant, that in 1939 uh, decided to merge, and they had a merging conference at uh, Kansas City. And my dad and my older sister uh, went along with him and mother. And after the conference was over, we sat in on some of the sessions. And after the conference was over, we went up to visit mother's cousins she hadn't seen and some she'd never seen in western Nebraska and spent quite a bit of time with them doing the West. And wonderful trip. And then I came back to write, and uh, I'd been on a leave of absence, and I joined the, I uh, put on uh, the single cylinder testing, which is where they find out the, the troubles on small scale, break up one in, one cylinder at a time without having nine or 14 or 18 to wreck the whole thing. And uh, in the course of that, this would be 1939. I didn't really think the war was quite over the horizon, despite what was going on. I didn't think our involvement was. And the fellow came along from Tulsa and offered me half again as much as I was making to get into the geophysics industry with him in Tulsa, oil exploration. And I had my college bills to pay. I was still in debt. I went to s my indebtedness for seven years in college, just in comparison to what you do today, was five thousand dollars, which looked a lot bigger then than it does now. Mm -hmm. I guess I did have some scholarships along the line that helped out. And so I grabbed the opportunity and joined them in Tulsa and was designing equipment. Our firm, with the name of Well Surveys, claimed to be the first commercial firm to utilize uh, gamma ray radiation. We explored old oil wells, and uh, a foot of concrete or steel didn't disturb the gamma radiation penetrated it all right. So we could go in an old oil well that maybe had gone dry at some considerable depth and tell where there were other sands along the way uh, where they could blow off the casing and uh, resume production. A well, I just happened, my job was designing equipment for this. And, uh, a well, however, I did go out on an experimental well or an experimental run. I usually took the, any new piece of equipment out myself to run it the first time and then break in the crew on it. And one well, I guess it's the last well I worked on, when they blew off the casing, was a bigger well at a shallower depth than the original had ever been. Mm. This only applied to a particular group of old wells that had been drilled under conditions where they didn't really know where they were going. They, they uh, would, circumstances were such they could go through a producing horizon and not know about it. They don't do that anymore.
And then to complete that story, when the draft came along in 1940, the oil industry was not essential. That didn't last, but anyhow, when I was there, and so I got back into essential industry and went to work for Lawrence Aeronautical Corporation in Linden, New Jersey. Charles Lawrence is a was one of the famous air, airplane engine pioneers. He was educated in France and became enamored of the French radial and rotary and various other forms of that sort. And he was the person generally credited with bringing the radial engine to America. He was building engines himself. In fact, he was the only one that had contracts. Somewhere 1919, 1920, the Navy gave him some contracts because they didn't like water-cooled engines. He was making air-cooled radials. And Wright Aeronautical bought him out on an exchange of stock basis. Lawrence used to chuckle that when he received his first annual report of Wright Aeronautical, he discovered that he and Vanderbilt had a majority of the stock. And so he went around to see Van and say, hey Van, we, we own this place, what are we going to do about it? Vanderbilt says, the first thing we're going to do is make you president. He was president from whenever that was until 1930. We had a disagreement with the firm on diesels. He wanted to go ahead on diesels, and they didn't, so he split off and went ahead on diesels. But never got anywhere. When World War II came along, the British first recognized the need for auxiliary power in their PT boats. The electrical equipment that day, just communication equipment, they didn't have any detection equipment in there at all, but they did want to be able to keep a track of talk to whomever needed talking to within a reasonable radius. And uh, the electrical equipment was so, well, of course, the PC boats also, I think, had electric hot plates. And somebody told me there were some electrical machine gun mounts. I'd never checked that out. They simply couldn't carry batteries enough to operate this equipment for any period of time when the engines are shut down. And it seems sort of ridiculous to run a thousand horse engine to carry a few kilowatts on the generator. So someone conceived the notion of a small engine running a generator to maintain power when they didn't have their main engine generators. And uh, Charlie picked up that and was in the business of making what are called auxiliary engines or auxiliary engine generator sets. First for the British Marine or British Navy, and then we had them in our own PT boats, and then the same problems, in fact, to a different degree, showed up in the flying boats. And uh, the cattle, the two-engine Catalinas didn't have them, but all the four-engine flying boats had them. The Catalina was the PBY, the four engine were the PB2Y3s and 5s. They had the same situation, assuming they ran out of fuel someplace or other. But almost all their fuel, you don't run a, you can't drain a tank completely on an aircraft engine. Had a few gallons left over. And it'd be sort of nice to have a power unit they can use to furnish the power after the batteries run down to communicate and tell people where they are and what help you need. And so the same little auxiliary engines went in the four-engine bombers. Uh, and eventually in the Army B-29s, but those were a different unit. So in 
39, you were working with Charlie? Yeah, I went there the summer of... I, I guess it was January of 1940. Well, wait a minute. My mind's a little... I forget when the draft was. The draft was in September, and I moved in January, whenever that was. 41. 41. And did you join up with Charlie before or after Pearl Harbor? Before. Before. That, gee, I... I we got to be more carefully on that. Let me ch change the tape when the time has come for these dates. I was with Lawrence at Pearl Harbor. In fact, I got it engaged on Pearl Harbor Day. So that was an anniversary I could keep straight. So you were with him before Pearl Harbor, did... About a year, ago. Yeah. Did Pearl Harbor change the business then, with, with the war now more real? We still made the same thing. We had no other, no change in products. We had a active Navy contracts on a 30 cubic inch auxiliary engine and on a 75 cubic inch five cylinder. And we were working developing a 20 cubic inch unit for the Navy for the B-29s. Nothing changed. We, of course, had been fighting priority problems all along. Actually, we could usually work. We had a priority good enough to get what they wanted, we were considered. For a while, we had a higher priority than the airplanes did, which mm -hmm. seemed a little strange. I don't remember which they were, or which it was at the time, but we were able to get what we needed. What did you think about Pearl Harbor? About the dropping of bombs? I was surprised that it happened. We hadn't. We knew that the newspapers were filled with the story of the negotiations that were supposed to be going on and that sort of thing, but not in detail. And I didn't realize that things were as critical as they were. I guess from there, what, how did you feel about the uh, internment of the Japanese Americans? Did you, I mean, was that publicized? I, yes, it was. And I felt it was a crime then, and I still think so. I have a Californian friends who insist that they have a, had a mortal fear of the Japanese, and the, he thinks that... Uh, there was some justification for it. I don't. The, the Nisi troops, we, the flyers we had, certainly distinguished themselves afterward. And furthermore, I think not restoring things to them, but trying to buy them off at pennies on the dollar was nothing short of criminal.
I think only the native Indians have been treated worse. So why was Pearl Harbor such a surprise? A problem. We certainly didn't want the Japanese to know that we had figured out the objective. And what was that? Pearl Harbor. And it's only recently that it's come out that their first objective was Wake after we'd broken the code and uh, but we didn't know they were referring to it. The Japanese had a code for it, and some wit and in intelligence said the thing to do is let's try running a uh, uncoded message that there's a water shortage in Wake and see what happens. And sure enough, naval in uh, intelligence picked up a message later on that there is a water problem that. Uh, this code and that told them that was the code of what the objective had been and they had apparently switched to Pearl Harbor. One of the little gems you pick up on the History Channel that they didn't tell us 60 years ago. Do you think that the people in your community at the time and, and your family members shared your sentiments on that? That it was criminal that the Japanese were putting in training in camp? Oh, I'm quite certain that my sisters, oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, I think our whole family, as for the other people, I don't remember we were discussing this sort of thing. So it wasn't really a topic that was open for discussion among friends? Well, we didn't know the details, and we figured they knew what they were doing, and, uh, they had more facts than we did. Even then, I wasn't very strong on wild speculation. Studying history has given several lessons in that. So after Pearl Harbor, how did the industry, your job, change in terms of the war effort? I don't remember when it became immediate. Maybe it was after Pearl Harbor or somewhere along there. We, we switched from an ordinary work day to a... 8 a.m. to 5.46 p.m. day, Lawrence. And why was that? Because of demand? Well, get more work done. So there was now pressure on the yeah. industry. At least that is for... I don't know about, the, uh, I'm sure the hourly people were still, they had three shifts, so what the heck, but we salaried people. Day was lengthened by however much that made it. Let's see, eight to six would be nine hours, wouldn't it? Assuming we chiseled just a little on lunch. Did the war change your financial situation within your family? No. Where were you living at this time? Uh, 
I wonder if you should reorganize this just a little bit. And, um, I mean, you know what you're doing. I don't. But uh, maybe uh, you know, we're, we've got two general areas here. I wonder if it would make more sense to get the whole chronology straight and then fit whatever you wish into wherever you want it, wherever it belongs. I got you as far as Lawrence Aeronautical. Uh, by 1944, Due to Lawrence's inability to, not Charlie Lawrence, but the firm's inability to face some problems, we lost our Army contract. And I just wondered about the Navy contract, and I, my personal guess was that we were going to go under in six months. I was wrong. It took a year. But when I saw this in the offing, I decided I'd better find more secure employment someplace or other, and uh, was accepted at Jack and Heinz. I got there a day or so before D Day, June 6, 1944. And uh, then I finished the war there. Uh, post-war, 19 couple of years post-war, I, I was not laid off at Jack and Heinz. In fact, they were, uh, they did have some layoffs, but I didn't suffer from those. My the paper mill in Holly, which was then Eaton Dykeman, E-A-T-O-N hyphen D-I-K-E-M-A-N, was actually the Eaton Dykeman company, lost four key employees in about a year. It was wholly owned by my wife's grandfather, and by will he had willed it to his children in trusteeship and eventual ownership to his four grandchildren, of whom Ruth was one of them. And uh, when they lost four employees, my father-in-law approached and asked if I would care to join the firm and fill the gap. Under the circumstances, I saw no choice. All we had was her potential inheritance. There was no inheritance in my family. And so I came in August of 1947. And I've been here since. In 72, I retired from the firm for 25 years. And I've now been... Uh, retired and busier than I ever was when I worked for 25 years. I got interested in the Civil War. <laughs> we, we brought three daughters with us, the youngest in a basket, when we moved. And in a very short time, it seems like it was several years. But when there be a nice Wednesday or Sunday like this, at lunch, Ruth would say, I have had them all week. You and they are going to disappear someplace this afternoon, some pace of your own selection, and you're not going to show your faces around here any earlier than 5.45, time for dinner. Well, it didn't take us long to exhaust us all, most of the places to go. So we started exploring Gettysburg. 
And then I met people interested in the battle. I hadn't really paid attention to Gettysburg before. I, I knew there'd been a civil war and a battle. That was about all I knew when I came here. And in short order, I uh, became involved with the civil, Harrisburg Civil War Roundtable. And with my interest in firearms, I started asking stupid questions. I do that all the time, ask stupid questions and learn out what the right ones should be. I started asking stupid questions about the cannon. There's all sorts of information about the handguns and shoulder arms, and virtually none. There have only been maybe three books in this century dual justice the can or any sort of justice the canon. And for some good technical reasons, it's just a mess. Too many things are going on at one time and people use old names for new things and they they apply a familiar name instead of inventing a new name and do all sorts of things. One of the results of which was that seven discreetly different bore sizes were all called 12-pounder rifles. And it's just, it's just a sort of a problem that an engineer cannot resist. And so I hooked up and started studying the, the history of weapons and started working at the Military History Institute and I've been really, that's been my prime activity ever since. So you came to Cumberland County in 1947, 47. August, that I can remember. Whichever day the first Monday was, it was either the 8th or 10th, or maybe the With your wife and how many children? Three. And that was originally to work with your father-in-law? Yes. Okay. Now, was that company Jack and Hyde? No, no, Jack and Hines was in Cleveland. Okay. Actually, Maple Heights, if you want to, sp well, although we were spread, had plants scattered around town. Could you explain a little bit about what you did here in Carlisle, working for your father-in-law? Yes. Uh, basically, the firm was, well, the history of the firm, it was organized in uh, 1892 or thereabouts, I'm not sure of the date, as a blotting paper mill. And they had, until World War I, they, when there was lots of blotting paper and did a great deal of advertising and desk blotters and things like that, as well as the usual souvenir blotters, apparently they didn't do anything to brag about, but with difficulties they did survive. Uh, in 1913, my wife's grandfather, who was a paper maker trained in Auburn, Maine, was asked to help the firm out of some of the troubles and for which the present shareholders would surrender 65% of their stock 
and he started out with 65% ownership at a price I don't think should be publicized, but nonetheless, it, it, uh, dollars were bigger then, and took over the mill and operated it. Meanwhile, World War I came along, and the laboratory filter business was all in Europe. The prime suppliers were in England and Germany. I guess there's some coming from France, and of course all of that was shut off. And a prominent purchaser in the laboratory supply business, which was then Eimer and Amend, in New York City, and they've since had some mergers and changes. I was desperate for a filter paper supply and scurried about. I don't know how far they went, but they prevailed upon Eaton Dykeman to, uh, on the basis that filter paper and blotter pad, buying paper weren't all that far separate to start making filter paper for them. And eventually, the blotting papers, the paper business just disappeared. And we'd specialized, and there were a number of varieties of filter paper, and we were doing it. Essentially, we were, have always had the majority business, so far as I know. Other mills came and went. No one really competed with us in the laboratory business. After the war, after World War I, the European supplies started coming in again. About all the competition we had was theirs. Uh, the uh, And, and, and the filter paper, as far as we knew then, all had to be made from rags. So while the industry as a whole is gravitating to wood pulp for most of the industry, uh, the roofing felt business is discarded rags. Rags nobody else could use went into the roofing felt business, but except for that, we were almost, well, the writing paper business was putting a small amount of rags in the representative's rag paper, but sometimes this was just a few percent, never more than 30 or 40 percent, as far as I know. I don't know the business that well. And the family was doing well, supposedly. In 1933, the paper mill, then located in Lee, Massachusetts, became the biggest fire on record of Lee, totally destroyed. I don't think we should say much about it. I, I hear a lot of things. I made a point after I joined the firm when I was in Boston one time to visit the fire inspection agency in Boston and ask for the reports, to see some of the reports of the old fire inspections. And uh, the inspectors were doing their job and had been complaining about things that were never fixed for years. Basically, that was a fire waiting to happen. When I came here, as a total outsider from a radically different background, it looked to me as though we, the same management was really setting itself up for a repeat performance. And about the first thing, and my father was, I hate to say things against him, but 
he didn't seem to think it was his job to do anything about things that he could see. And so we got along very well. All I had to do was ask him questions like he'd answer with yes and go ahead. I really had no instruction. I, I sort of just sailed in and uh, tried to do the things that needed doing. And my first priority was to do what I could about obvious fire prevention things. Actually, we had a fire. Ruth and I were engaged in December of 1941, and in January of 1942 they had a fire that uh, they were able to control, but in retrospect it was needless. And so when I got here in 47 with that and the previous history, I started bearing down on fire protection in every way I could think of. One was to see what was obvious. Uh, one was to accompany every fire inspector that came around for both insurance companies and the Middle Department of Association of Fire Underwriters and so on on their tours and pick their minds. I deliberately tried to make the best possible friends with them and use them for teachers. And then the, so far as I know, the outstanding organization working on this is the National Association of Fire Protection. National Fire Protection, the NFPA Association, National Fire Protection Association. And, uh, proceeded to have us join it and among other things purchased a certain amount of their literature and one of the things they had was a a uh, fairly frequent, I think it was once a month, bulletin of conspicuous fires since the last one and what were felt to be the causes and pointing out the things you shouldn't do and that sort of thing. And I read those things for 25, essentially 25 years and tried to learn what I could from them. And nobody stood in the way of taking care of things as best we could, so I did. And uh, we had no serious fire on my watch. So that was essentially your role within your father-in-law's firm? Well, yes, that was my role, and of course I was doing other things. The mechanical end of the place was simply abysmal. We were 50 years out of date on operating the mill. We were running a great deal of the mill from a single big, we had four steam engines, but operating a great deal of the mill on one of them. Belt drives, line shafts, all the trimmings, which had another obvious problem. Anytime a single belt hook let go someplace or other, Essentially, the whole operation had to shut down, waiting for it to be repaired. And uh, it was nothing uncommon to see everybody sitting by a machine while somebody went someplace and repaired or replaced a belt or something like that. Uh, I didn't think that was a way to run a business. Turned out my grand wife's grandfather had a prejudice against V-belts, so everything was old, flat belts, uh, rubber, canvas, not many leather, all of which were had splices, and the splices were the weak point. 
and all of which would give trouble. I can't say exactly when industry as a general adopted individual drives for individual machines. So every machine has its own motor, electric drives of course, and you turn it on when you use it and you turn it off when you're not using it. And if a machine goes down, that operation stops, but, but the rest of the place goes on. And so in fairly short, we also had neglected to, um, all they had was 220 volt three phase for the larger motors. And that is not altogether as it should be. And so eventually the biggest project we did was to electrify the mill and uh, get 440 volt in there and put in modern equipment, modern unit drives and that sort of thing to eliminate the shutdown problem. Given a certain value for production, it's sort of expensive when the mill goes down from one to six hours because of some breakdown that could be prevented if we had individual electric motor drives. Furthermore, fuel was expensive and getting more so. And uh, we eventually relegated the motor, so the steam boiler, so that it was just for heating purposes. And a few processing, sometimes we had a heat water, but uh, basically the power was all taken care of electrically. Much more flexibly, uh, completely, everything in the mill. There isn't a, sort of a big day when we eliminated the fourth steam engine. Hmm. So what was your physical role in the modernization of this outdated firm? Well, there really isn't a title for my job. I, the title I used was mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never ran in any limitations on assignment. Mostly, I have a problem with. Well, let me back up. I didn't know what sort of engineers paper mills had. I quickly discovered it's predominantly chemical engineers. There are very few mechanicals about. Or in the big plants, they'll have a mechanical or two and heaven knows how many chemicals. Uh, I was asked many times how I dared tackle something like this. Aside from the expediency, I was quite certain if we did not protect my wife's interest in that place, somebody so sooner or later would figure out a weasel her out of it. More so, although I did not have the training in chem engineering, I, well, let me back up. My father never could get his mind clear that uh, mechanical engineering was not a trade school. And I had a little, I never really convinced him that it wasn't a trade school. This is training in the solution of problems. No matter what course you taught, at least the way it was taught at MIT, fundamentally you're, you're treated to approach problems in a systematic way, whatever they may be, and uh, get all the facts you can as an opener. And uh, if you have to make some assumptions, for heaven's sake, make a record of them. So it's perfectly clear what assumptions are made. And if you run into problems, another way to work on it is to change some of the assumptions. And then to try out a solution. And then when you're all done, 
which Washington hasn't learned to this day, apply the solution back to the problem or back to the facts. And if it fits the facts, you're home free. And if it doesn't, you better start over again. And so I assumed that my assignments here could be, and I sort of made them, was the endeavor systematically to solve what problems we had. And fire protection was one, and safety was another. And uh, occasionally we gotten some rows on accounting and sales proposing and economics of the various products and things like that. So I was, basically, I hate to have to put a single word on that, so just find the job description. What did you mean by protecting your wife's interest? Well, she was an eventual quarter owner of the mill. It had been passed to Calvin Yates' four grandchildren, and she was one of them. And uh, which had some value sometime under the right circumstances, and none, had none if the place went under. And I think anybody we could have hired would have demanded some sort of interest in the firm that he might be able to build up in the total, which is just what I did. I came, I came there, we had this promissory quarter interest, but uh, I just bought all the shares I could when I could over a period of time. One of the other grandchildren lost interest. He was there and he uh, had taken an aptitude test that said he was adapted for research and we weren't doing any and he was unhappy about not doing any research. So he wanted to go uh, where, where he'd be involved in research. And uh, okay, blessings on you, we'll figure out how to get a replacement for you. He says, by the way, my stock is for sale. Well, uh, Okay, what do you want for it? And I bought it from him. I didn't have the money to do it, but I had a supplier friend that says, what do you need? He says, I'm a lot more interested in going businesses than I am ones that have failed. And uh, he liked me. He liked what he saw. He'd worked with the firm for 40 years been a supplier to them and he liked what he saw and he felt there was a chance that maybe helping me grow in the mill would be profitable for him too and uh, so he loaned me the money on the most favorable terms I've about ever heard of and uh, let me pay back at my own pace and Incidentally, put the money in his firm's name, so if something happened to him, the estate couldn't lay a claim on it. I mean, well, he did everything he could think of. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we made him one of our directors, and you don't you don't overlook favors like that. He approached me. He got wind of the fact that I needed some money, and he came after me. I didn't tell him, and uh, that's what I call real friendship. He was an associate of your father-in-law's? No. Mm -hmm. No, he was a, a waste materials dealer in Reading, Pennsylvania. Okay. In fact, when we burned the ground, he located the place here in uh, Holly as an idle mill that he knew about and uh, supplied rags to us when we got it going, 1933. In fact, it was a good experience. I, I confess that sometimes I was susceptible when I was surrounded by people that had racial prejudices 
I sort of felt I'd get along with them better if I shared them. I don't know how much I believed them or didn't. In particular, one of the ridiculous ones, when I lived in Niagara Falls, there, uh, my little friends were had strong feelings about the Canucks. Well, how ridiculous can you get? And uh, eventually, through this deal here, uh, I had been in a circle that was quite strongly anti-Semitic, and I was kind of going along with him. And when he, of a different background, did this favor to me, I sort of said to myself, I'd better review my position on the people. Very, very useful in that way. How soon after you became familiar with your father-in-law's firm did you buy that stock that was for sale? That was just another, it wasn't a full quarter. Um, I don't remember. Somewhere around 1950, around three years. We worked together all right. We got along fine. We carpooled together. I had no inkling that he was uneasy until he suddenly announced out of a blue that um, he wanted something of more research and wasn't in sight there. Why did you retire from the business in 1972? Well, there's a long story going to this. I uh, eventually, I I can't even tell what year it was. I don't remember. I became president and had a. Essentially, I had by far the biggest block of stock. And as my kids are growing up and I started thinking about retirement of some sort, although I was only essentially 50 at the time, 48 I think, I just wondered what we were going to do long range. I had three daughters who were not interested. The one of the three grand or four grandchildren had already sold me his shares. The other one, my wife's brother, was severely handicapped. He'd been very badly hurt at birth, and uh, he could perform, but. Um, Basically, a psychiatrist once figured out that his cortex was damaged. And uh, so what do you do? What do you do for long range? And eventually, I, uh, in 1942, I merged with another fellow who had much the same problems. We had two daughters and no future for the mill. And we merged on the basis that, as far as I was concerned, that collectively we would be a more attractive merger than, than either of us were singly. 
and uh, basically uh, after we joined about all we discussed the directors meeting it was just a whole session succession of mergers <coughs> All of which had a hooker of some sort in them. Uh, apparently there's a lot of this going on. People are talking about this all the time. I didn't realize to quite such extent. Again, I can't tell you the span of time. I misled you on the date. Actually, our, our merger was 1970, it wasn't in 72. Sorry about that. And in that period of time, uh, 19... Well, first off, In the two years of working with them, I got along beautifully with the principal, but the man who was my immediate superior was very good at giving me damned if you do, damned if you don't assignments. And no matter what I did was wrong. And in 1972, we parted company. I stayed as a director, but uh, left the firm physically. And then we'd already been talking mergers, and we were for, and again, I can't give you the date, I don't know it offhand, but anyhow, we had all this merger discussions with every board meeting, and eventually found a financial man, I'll call him a Walt Streeter because I don't know what property to call him. His name was Bradford Mills. His base operation was in Princeton, New Jersey. But he had some sort of a connection with Bessemer Trust in New York. And if you had a New York meeting, uh, we met in the Bess Bessemer Trust offices. He had had a military political career sometime. He'd been, I think, an undersecretary of the Navy sometime before. And his money, to a large extent, apparently from what he said, was European money they want to invest here. And uh, in, uh, I can't remember the year, but anyhow, he... He eventually made a cash buyout proposition for the combined firm that was far better, far more attractive than any of the merger propositions had been. Had fewer pitfalls and more attractive and was for cash. So we did so. And that left me in the position of living on my ill-gotten gains for the rest of my life. You mentioned that a lot of these mergers were taking place. What conditions contributed to that happening so frequently? Well, I can't say we got two bases looking at it. One is just plain numerically. The other is looking at the size of the industry. The paper industry is perhaps the third biggest industry as a whole in the country. And uh, with the size of it, a very small percentage of mergers could be a large number. Okay. Uh, people just, just saw opportunities and uh, I can't, I wasn't a party to any of those mergers, but 
they're still going on. In our case, a little quirk in the tax law, well, that's the other thing I was afraid of. My father-in-law was virtually bankrupted when he took over the firm from his father. Uh, the IRS valued the firm, and it didn't occur to him to fight it, so he paid an enormous tax. And... Uh, I saw no possibility of doing that with the mill as it had been built up in the interim. Uh, it was illegal to write up your assets. You were, whatever you had, you had to depreciate. You could, you could deduct your depreciation, but with inflation going on at the same time, you got badly out of step with what real values were. And you couldn't rewrite your assets at a current value. You had to take it on the depreciated value, no matter what the replacement cost would be. And essentially, this made the future, as I saw it, under the tax laws then, virtually impossible. Whoever took over the, all the firm I had, wouldn't have been able to swing it. I don't know about the legality, but as a practical matter, legal or illegal, when somebody buys the firm, what it's worth is what he pays for it, no matter what the depreciated values are, and he gets a fresh step start on depreciation. It isn't fair, it isn't reasonable, it doesn't work for this situation, but it is the real world. And I suspect some of the other mergers might have been the same sort of thing, on a different scale. Just to show you, I don't know whether it's for the record, but Supposing that you have something that re comes to, trickles down from a million dollar investment that's depreciated to $100,000. That's all the tax-free depreciation you have. Supposing that in the meanwhile, $100,000 won't begin to buy it, that it takes, or a million dollars won't begin, it's supposed to become a million, a $10 million investment. Uh, you have nothing to work with. But somebody who buys it for $10 million can say that's a $10 million investment and defend that's a, that's a cash on hand. You want to see the check? And he can start the depreciation all over and easily uh, have depreciation enough to uh, carry him so that he has a fair opportunity to buy more equipment. So, generally what events led to your retirement? What's that? What, generally what events or motives led to your retirement in 72? Well, why did I retire? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, mostly because I never solved the problem of uh, how to full satisfy anybody with uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't assignments. So I was quite willing to that plus an opportunity to uh, no, well, basically that's it. And I saw my way clear. I saw I could get along, and I wasn't unhappy to leave the place. And 
I promptly started studying military history, and I've been at it ever since. What aspects of military history do you enjoy most? Well, I've specialized on... People call me a Civil War expert. I don't buy that at all. I'm, I, all the Civil War is the background for my interest in the artillery. A number of different things are happening at the same time that were very confusing. Well, so long as we were staying with smooth bores, uh, bronze made an acceptable smooth bore. Okay, newspaper. Usually a guy. Uh, bronze did not work at all with rifles. You make, can make them out of bronze, but. Uh, they wore out before they wore in. Mm. Cast iron had been a, also a principal material of choice. And uh, cast iron just wouldn't stand up to the duties that were placed on it. They didn't know why. 